Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this media webinar on a very important aspect of the entire renewable energy space in India. I'm very glad to find that we have new colleagues and friends joining this webinar and colleagues and friends who have joined this series of webinars earlier. For those who have joined this series of webinars earlier under the Renewable Energy in India project of the Internews Earth Journalism Network, they know that this is a project where we are trying to boost the factual reportage on renewable energy issues in the country. We have three focus states, Maharashtra, Karnataka, and Tamil Nadu, because these have been leading states in the overall field of renewable energy. And we have held media webinars specifically focused on these three states. We have also held one media webinar focused on a related topic of clean mobility all over India and another on renewable energy, how it's playing out, how the market is playing out all over the country. And I'm very glad that many of you joined those webinars and I'm extremely glad that many of you have joined the webinar today. Because today we are moving beyond that to an area where many of us journalists, especially those covering the environment, do not often move into, but which is extremely crucial. Today, we are going to listen to the, de the developers and entrepreneurs who are in the renewable energy space. Today, we are going to listen to the people who are actually doing the work, who are actually look, looking at how to develop renewable energy in the country. We have eminent developers, entrepreneurs with us, and I'm very glad that they have joined us. We are very thankful to them. And to all my journalists, my, my request is that please uh, listen to them carefully, ask your questions. We have already requested two of the speakers if we can share their presentations with you and they've said yes we'll request all of them uh, and ho hopefully they will all agree and the presentations will be available the recording will be available so rather than try to take notes now my request to all of you is to listen carefully have your questions use the q a box to uh, put down your questions uh, to specific uh, speakers or to everybody if you wish to. I'm going to come back at the end of this webinar to tell you something exciting. What I, again, for those who have been joining these webinars before and who have been part of this project, they know that again, as a part of this project of boosting coverage of renewable energy in India, we at the Earth Journalism Network have been putting out open calls for applications from journalists for story grants. Because as working journalists, we know that one of the problems that journalists face is that media houses are in a difficult economic situation and may not be able or willing to invest money in news gathering. So that's the gap we try to fill uh, by putting out an open call uh, for applications for story grants. So there is a story grant application out right now. Uh, and I'm going to share the link and the details with you towards the end of the webinar. But first, we ought to listen to the speakers and I'm absolutely sure that you're going to get lots of story ideas from these speakers. I do have one request that if you are actually, you know that we do not ask you to 
do a story because you joined the webinar. But we do have a request. If you do a story based on what you've heard in this webinar, then please share the link with us. That will be very helpful to us. Having said this, I'm going to now hand over to my colleague, Sapna Gopal, who's the moderator of today's webinar. Sapna, over to you. Thank you, uh, Joydeep, and uh, welcome to uh, all our panelists and all our audience and to this uh, very special uh, webinar, which is not just restricting itself to solar and wind, but we're going a little more ahead, as you will realize. Uh, before going into the webinar, I am just uh, quickly going to share a PPT with you, uh, which is just touching upon the few, I mean, the topics that are going to be uh, discussed in detail by our uh, esteemed speakers. So uh, this is... So like uh, we all know, we are speaking about uh, Ari in India, and uh, we're speaking about new businesses and innovations uh, in the sector. So this is the theme for uh, today's webinar. So one of the issues that is going to be raised is round the clock power by uh, one of our speakers, uh, Mr. Vinay Pabba. So round the clock power has been uh, in the news of late with MNRE uh, you know, issuing notifications and trying to encourage the same uh, for the RE sector. And uh, as you can see in the slide, uh, while India is uh, committed to installing uh, 175 gigawatts uh, through RE sources by 2022 and 450 gigawatts by 2030, Intermittent power generated uh, through renewable energy sources has always been a concern. Uh, so now you may say, what is uh, intermittent power? So just to put it in a very brief way, it's like solar and wind energy. Uh, the energy generated by them is not very predictable. So it's there sometimes. And, you know, so it's not constantly, constantly available. And so that's why they're referred to as intermittent uh, energy resources. So in order to bridge this gap, the uh, MNRE has uh, come up with the uh, round the clock power concept. And uh, this entails that conventional and non-conventional resources will complement each other to provide power to the grid. And uh, last year in May, uh, there was uh, encouraging news uh, on this front when the center awarded a contract for the supply of 400 megawatts of solar and wind energy. And the Solar Energy Corporation of India and Renew Power signed a PPA, a power purchase agreement for round the clock su energy supply through, uh, through RE. So this is a, a development in terms of round the clock power. However, the issues related to this, the challenges and what it means for uh, the RE sector in India, uh, as I mentioned earlier, will be discussed in detail by uh, our esteemed panelist, uh, Mr. Vinay Papa. The other topic that we would be deliberating on today is energy storage, which has again been in the news. Uh, there has been a lot of buzz about energy storage and how it is the most important thing for the energy sector now. And India is not uh, isolated either in this. And encouragingly for India, the International Energy Agency in its uh, recent um, a report which uh, was about uh, India, uh, titled India Energy Outlook 2021. It has actually projected that India could have 140 to 200 gigawatt of battery storage capacity by 2040. And that is potentially a third of total battery storage capacity in the world. So uh, going by the figures, it does seem very encouraging. And it seems like energy storage has huge potential in India. However, uh, our esteemed panelist, uh, Mr. Rahul Valbalkar, will be talking about it uh, shortly, uh, about uh, the challenges that lie uh, ahead for energy storage in India, the issues that are there. So that will be spoken about him. The other issue that we'll be deliberating on is about why, uh, um, like unlike round the clock power and energy storage, which, which have got uh, you know, some encouraging news uh, recently. Uh, the rooftop solar, however, has not really taken off, going by the figures uh, in, in the recent past. So uh, the, according to news reports, uh, in contrast with its 40 gigawatt target, 
rooftop solar grew from 623 megawatt in 2015 to 5,440 megawatt by end of 2019. And uh, in 2021, around 20, uh, 200 megawatts was added. And the figure right now is 5,650 megawatts. So it's nowhere close to the target that was actually uh, you know, meant for rooftop solar. And a lot of, lot of uh, there was a lot of hope uh, from uh, rooftop solar, considering the amount of sunshine that is in India and the demand that is there in India for energy and power. So this is again something which will be spoken about in detail by our panelist, uh, Mr. Sunil Jain, who will be joining us a little later uh, in the session. And uh, then we will also be talking about waste to energy, uh, which we have not really raised in the last few webinars that we have had. So uh, um, Chamin Sharma, who has actually uh, had, you know, uh, experience of doing this on the field and, uh, you know, so she will be talking about waste to energy in India, or what are the issues, what are the challenges, uh, she would be kind of detailing on that. Uh, however, I am just in my PPT talking very briefly about uh, what has developed, uh, you know, uh, in August 2021, this is the development as per August 2021. And uh, so the United Nations Industrial Development Organization and, and the MNRE, they uh, launched the Global Environment Facility Funded Loan Interest Sub uh, Subvention Scheme that provides financial aid to innovative uh, waste to energy biomethane projects and business models. Uh, what was also launched was a GIS based inventory tool of organic, organic waste streams was developed under the GEF MNRE UNIDO project. This was also launched uh, in August, 2021. The tool interestingly provides district level estimates of available urban and industrial organic wastes and their energy generation potential across India. And this uh, is, uh, it's intends to enable small and medium enterprises and project developers to set up new waste to energy projects and it is, being hoped that may also uh, facilitate the rapid growth of the bio within in waste to energy sector in India. So this very briefly is I have just touched upon the topics that are going to be uh, you know spoken in detail uh, by our panelists. So uh, we will now uh, move on to our first uh, esteemed speaker of the day, uh, Mr. Rahul Valvalkar, who is the president and MD uh, of uh, Cust customized. Uh, uh, sorry. So he will be speaking about energy storage and uh, the issues that concern energy storage in India. Mr. Rahul, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Sapna and uh, Jaydev, first of all, for uh, organizing this important uh, discussion. And again, I would like to thank all the participants who have joined to learn about uh, some of this topic, because I think technically, as well as business-wise, we are doing a lot of things in this area. Uh, but in terms of uh, taking India forward, uh, we definitely need to communicate these uh, uh, across the entire uh, stakeholders. Uh, so this is very important. So again, happy to take uh, any questions uh, towards end of it. Uh, but to start the context, uh, as uh, Sapna introduced, I am President and Managing Director of Customized Energy Solutions India, which is part of a global uh, uh, group called Customized Energy Solutions headquartered in US. I'm also founder and president of India Energy Storage Alliance, uh, uh, which was formed in 2012 with a goal of making India a global hub for R&D, manufacturing and adoption of advanced energy storage and e-mobility technologies. Uh, we have more than 150 companies as uh, uh, part of this alliance and uh, we work very closely with various government stakeholders for framing the policies as well as uh, work across the complete value chain right from the supply chain manufacturing to uh, uh, various type of uh, adopters including renewable energy developers and uh, end consumers. Uh, so when it comes to energy storage, uh, there are a range of technologies which uh, form energy storage as an asset class. Uh, there are batteries or which can be considered as electrochemical storage technologies. Within that, we have almost around 10 to 15 different type of batteries. Lead acid batteries, I think everyone is familiar with it. Uh, nickel based batteries like nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydrate have been around for a long time, especially for consumer applications or applications like railways. Most recently lithium ion batteries have been uh, focus of lot of attention and are seeing tremendous growth. 
Uh, there are also other technologies which are coming up like metal air batteries, sodium based batteries. Uh, so this is a very vibrant uh, field where billions of dollars are getting invested and manufacturing is scaling up around the globe. Uh, but uh, electrochemical is not the only form of uh, storage technologies. There are mechanical systems like flywheels or compressed air energy storage systems. There are gravity based technologies like pumped hydro, which has been around for centuries. But there are even newer forms of gravity based technologies where people are looking at moving concrete blocks using cranes or uh, using sort of a train type of a mechanism uh, and use that for storing energy. Uh, thermal energy is another form which is very, very widely used and particularly given the demographic changes which are happening in India with uh, air conditioning usage increasing as well as various uh, applications such as cold storage chains and other aspects. I think thermal storage is a very important part and parcel of the solution. Uh, there are chemical storage technologies like hydrogen, uh, which includes again fuel cell as a on the generation side, but uh, electrolyzers for generating hydrogen and then fuel cells for consuming it or generating electricity. There are pure electrical storage technologies such as ultra capacitors, which are again used for applications where you need instantaneous power, uh, like uh, in elevators for using regenerative braking or storing the energy. Uh, and then there are power electronics, which converts the direct current power into alternative current or vice versa. So there are range of technologies which are part of the energy storage as an asset class. Now coming to the topic in terms of the renewables, why renewables and storage is being talked about together. Because if you see uh, this sort of a simple representation, what you are seeing on the brown curve is that is a typical load shape where at night you have like a low loads uh, on the electric grid and in the morning it starts going up depending on season you may have a morning peak then again a evening peak or you may have like an afternoon peak and then the load goes down and when you are looking at solar uh, solar is energy generated typically between say 8 a.m to 5 p.m in the evening uh, the wind may have depending on the region certain patterns where more wind may be gen getting generated at late at night or early in the morning and then in the afternoon the wind typically uh, slows down again this is very much dependent on the geography but uh, that's just as an example so when you just add do hybrid in terms of solar and wind people assume that oh uh, one is at night one is at day so we can have a perfectly balanced but when you start looking at on an instantaneous basis or five minute by five minute 15 minute by 15 minute you will notice that if you start adding wind plus solar, then it doesn't match the typical load shift which most of the utilities are facing and there is a gap. So that means that apart from having wind and solar, you need to have either conventional generation or some other technologies which can meet this. And that's where energy storage is getting a lot of interest in this. Now coming to India, India has very ambitious roadmap where as you know, uh, MNRE has set a uh, ambitious target of getting to 175 gigawatt of renewables by 2022. Now with COVID, we are all of us are expecting there will be at least one or two years of delays in actually reaching that capacity. Although MNRE has uh, already issued many tenders. So in terms of the project announcements, we are getting closer to the capacity. But in terms of the installed capacity, we as a country have just crossed 100 gigawatt. And for getting additional 75 gigawatt, depending on how uh, fast we implement uh, the announced projects, it will need at least two to three years, if not more. Uh, uh, but we are not going to stop there. Already Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Modi ji has announced a very ambitious roadmap for getting to 450 gigawatt by 2030. So that means that we have to continuously go and keep on adding more and more renewables uh, into the grid. And that's a part where uh, uh, Sapna mentioned about uh, some of the challenges uh, which are faced because of the variability of the renewables, where one is there is a natural variability, which I showed earlier, but within that uh, you get uh, significant changes, like for example, because of cloud cover, even during day, you may have a significant drop in the solar output, or if the wind speed changes, you can have a significant change in the wind farm output. And typically wind and solar both have what is called as plant load factor. So uh, basically whatever capacity you have installed, 
if you are generating 24 by 7 uh, throughout the year, then you will have a 100% load factor. But since a solar energy is typically available only during six to eight hours when the energy is generated, maximum you can theoretically get up to like 30, 33%. But within that, there is a bell curve of the generation. So typical low, uh, uh, PLF for a solar would be somewhere between 18 to 22% as a solar energy. And for wind, depending on the wind resource availability, it may be between 30 to 40% as a PLF. So, uh, Various agencies, including Solar Energy Corporation of India, is looking at ways where storage can be used to get this PLF beyond 60% so that the transmission capacity, the distribution capacity, the entire other electric grid investments which are happening, they can also be optimized and you are not making investments in assets which are getting underutilized. Also, this is very important in terms of getting dispatching the other resources so that you don't end up uh, uh, adding renewables, but at the same time, uh, relying very heavily on thermal generation for backup. Now, uh, many people do say that, oh, in India, we already have invested very heavily in many ultra mega thermal projects, and these projects are right now not being operated fully. So why do we need to add any new technologies or new investments in storage? Why don't we just keep on relying on thermal plants for balancing renewables? Now, technically, that is a perfectly viable solution, and we can do that. But we need to understand that there are two impacts. So one is we are adding more and more renewables because we have certain environmental goals. And when you start using thermal plants just as a peaking plants or just as a balancing plants, then you can lose at least 20% of the carbon dioxide emission reduction because when you're operating thermal plants at lower output level, uh, their heat rate gets uh, uh, increases. So that means you are consuming more fuel for generating same amount of energy. Uh, so that may lose uh, some of the benefit in terms of the CO2 emission. But the other critical emissions which are important for air quality are the uh, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide emissions. And you may lose if you are ramping these thermal plants too much, you may lose as much as 100% of the benefit of adding renewables. So that's a part where I think storage technologies are emerging as a key solution. And around the world, this is the fastest growing combination where typically many renewable projects are coming in, even at gigawatt scale, where people are adding uh, four to six hours of energy storage for with uh, renewables. Now, this is not only for grid scale, even when you see customers and uh, many type of commercial and industrial customers who are now finding renewable energy as very cost effective because in India, most of the commercial and uh, industrial customers pay minimum six rupee, but typically eight to 10 rupee per kilowatt hour as a electricity tariff to the distribution companies. And uh, that's the area where adding uh, storage along with uh, uh, rooftop solar can help companies in getting better utilization of renewable energy and reducing their energy cost by uh, significant margin. Uh, obviously, this can only be done by companies who have sufficient space available for deploying distributed solar. But there are many customers and what you are seeing on the left hand side charts on red is not a week long or monthly consumption pattern, but there are different industries like pulp and paper or steel uh, where their daily load in fact fluctuates depending on the processes what they are using. So if you are just doing solar, which is like a bell curve, then you would end up using very low amount of solar energy. And that means you are still consuming more than 90% of energy from the grid. Or if you end up oversizing the solar, then there will be significant part of solar energy, which you'll have to give back to the grid. And now with net metering rules uh, changing, uh, uh, you will be getting only paid maybe two rupees as a gross metering uh, for this energy which you are feeding back into the grid. So it may be better to store that energy and use it for offsetting purchasing power at eight rupee or 10 rupee during peak time from the distribution company. Uh, now everyone asked question about price and this is a price trend on how the prices are changing. And this is a part where with energy storage, it becomes slightly tricky and uh, gets a little bit complicated. So if you are not used to it, uh, please feel free to have a separate question and answer uh, related to this. But uh, there are two aspects. Many times we end up talking about just the capital cost of storage technologies. But ultimately, when you hear about the PPA contracts uh, being signed up, what is most important is the levelized cost of energy, where you need to consider the cost of energy of uh, the source, which is maybe solar in this case, as well as the 
additional cost which you have to pay for uh, uh, investing in the storage technologies. So this levelized cost depends on many factors which include the round trip efficiency of storage, what is the cycle life of the storage, that means how many times you can use the same battery for charging, discharging, how deep you are going to discharge the battery every time because that will determine the size of the battery as well as other system level cost. Uh, so if you see the bottom chart that shows the levelized tariff of blended cost because uh, just take a simple example, you have maybe a one megawatt solar. So one megawatt solar may generate four to five megawatt hour in any given day as a electricity. So one is megawatt when you're talking about, you're talking about the power rating. And when you're saying four or five megawatt hour, that is a total amount of energy generated during the day. So if you size the storage system at say 50% of the solar system, then that means you are putting a half a megawatt or 500 kilowatt storage system for four hours. That means you can store out of the five megawatt hour energy generated around two megawatt hour of energy and use it to meet your peak load requirement. So when you do this blended tariff calculation already, you can get uh, for four hour systems uh, price points of around five rupees. And uh, uh, if you are doing one hour storage system, then the price is below four rupees. And as the storage systems are improving in terms of the cycle life, in terms of the reducing the capital cost, we expect these prices in next five to six years get down between uh, three to uh, four rupees for uh, one hour and four hour systems respectively. So when you consider that CNI customers are paying already six rupees or eight rupees for every unit of electricity they are purchasing, you can see that renewables plus storage is already a cost viable solution for these customers. So there are many policies which have been uh, uh, done at both center and government level over the last seven, eight years. So this is not something which is happening overnight, although the interest which is uh, uh, generated right now is quite a lot. But we as an India Energy Storage Alliance have been working with uh, many government agencies right since 2013 in facilitating these policies. And we are really happy that right now the importance of this area has been paid attention directly at the level of prime minister where he himself and the prime minister's office is paying attention to the uh, energy storage as one of the areas. And what we are most excited about is we are no longer looking at it only from the demand generation, but we are also looking at this from the manufacturing point of view as well. So as the India Energy Storage Alliance, each year we release uh, various reports where we do uh, project uh, projections for next uh, seven years. Uh, so the last year's report suggested that the stationary energy storage market potential in India over these seven years is around 250 gigawatt hour and additional 150 gigawatt hour as a base case scenario for electric vehicles, uh, the batteries required for electric vehicles. Uh, but uh, if you see the kind of uh, push in electric vehicles we are seeing particularly in last three, four months with some of the changes in the fame policy, uh, we think that we may end up going closer to the uh, optimistic scenario where the total demand for batteries for electric vehicles in India could cross 300 gigawatt hour. So we are looking at minimum 400 gigawatt hour to uh, uh, maybe around uh, 700 gigawatt hour as a potential demand over next seven years for these advanced batteries in India. Uh, if you want to know more about this and what is happening around uh, the country, you can visit the IESA website, indiaesa.info. And we have, as part of our initiatives, we maintain a database called India Energy Storage Database, where you can click and you can find out information about some of the current projects which are being built. Uh, you get some information about that, the charging infrastructure which is being built, various uh, R&D institutions who are working in this. So all this information is available to you if you need any information on that. Now, the last point I would like to emphasize is about manufacturing. And this is a part where we are seeing tremendous improvement globally, where the global energy storage manufacturing, uh, particularly for lithium ion batteries, has increased from just around 10 gigawatt hour in 2010 to more than three, uh, 400 gigawatt hour uh, manufacturing capacity, annual manufacturing capacity as of 2020. And this is expected to increase another five to eight fold in next uh, uh, five years itself to cross more than 3000 uh, uh, mega, uh, mega, uh, gigawatt hour of annual production capacity around the globe. And as a result of this manufacturing scale up, we have seen exponential price reduction, where particularly for some of the technologies like lithium ion batteries, the prices have reduced by 10x in last 10 years. 
so the prices have basically right now the prices what you are seeing in the market are hardly 10% of the prices at the start of two, uh, 2010 and apart from the capital cost reduction there is a tremendous improvement happening on performance where the cycle life is increasing the energy density is increasing so if you see the right hand side chart we are talking about energy density in terms of the volumetric density as well as uh, for weight and uh, just to give you like a visual uh, uh, interpretation if you are talking about 100 watt hour per kg then the weight can be considered as these blocks but if you double that then that means you are reducing the weight or volume uh, significantly so uh, that's the advantage which is happening so within last 10 years the energy density for some of these batteries have uh, gone up from 100 to now almost more than 250 to 270 watt hour per kg and uh, this is something which is causing additional opportunities Manufacturing is a global trend. We are seeing uh, China taking a dominant position already, but now Europe and America is catching up with uh, hundreds of gigawatt hour of manufacturing facilities coming up in these both regions in next five years. And Niti Aayog has also announced a, a advanced chemistry cell a battery production link incentive scheme where we are looking at getting around 50 gigawatt hour of manufacturing for uh, advanced uh, energy storage technologies in India. And India Energy Storage Alliance expects that uh, there will be uh, somewhere between 80 to 100 gigawatt hour of bids will be received by the government. So we are very excited that in next five years, we should also have some of these gigafactories uh, uh, setting up in India and we can significantly reduce our dependence on China or uh, Korea for importing uh, these advanced batteries. Uh, there is a lot of things happening around the globe. There are new technologies which are emerging. Uh, again, we have this magazine called Emerging Technology News where we release such information. So I'll be happy to share more details if anyone is interested. And in this regard, I would request all of you to also block your calendar for 22nd September, which gets celebrated as Global uh, Energy Storage Day or World Energy Storage Day uh, since uh, 2017. Uh, uh, 22nd September is equinox, so day and night is balanced. So using that theme around the world for last five years, various storage associations have been celebrating the World Energy Storage Day. And last year, we hosted first global conference where we had Nobel laureate professor Stanley Whittingham as a, a keynote speaker. And uh, the conference featured more than 80 global speakers. Uh, uh, it was almost like a marathon 20 hour conference. And this year, again, we are hosting it on 22nd September, where we are dividing world in four regions. And you will see more than 150 global thought leaders speaking in the conference, as well as various uh, workshops uh, uh, throughout the day. These are some of the workshops which will be held on the day, including energy storage financing, energy access, manufacturing supply chain, long duration storage, battery recycling, urban air mobility, safety, uh, startups, solar plus storage, and so on. So, and this event is free to attend. So again, I would encourage you to get involved. And we are also have an open call right now for uh, various startups to join us and we will be connecting them with investors. So this uh, we expect will be one of the largest uh, uh, gathering of uh, startups uh, uh, around the world, focusing on energy storage, e-mobility, green hydrogen, and uh, energy access. So we are very excited that this is not just about limited about just five, six large companies and what they do in this, but uh, there is a very vibrant ecosystem around e-mobility as well as stationary storage, which is getting built and driven by startups. And uh, there are agencies like Unido who are supporting uh, funding for beta deployment, which is first time happening in India. So this is really exciting time. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any additional questions, you can visit the India ESA website or etn.news uh, uh, as an emerging technology news uh, and uh, reach out to us by email for uh, any questions. We are really excited with the improvements which have happened in last 10 years and we think next five years are going to be very, very critical. And these will determine if India just ends up developing as a market or if we can also become a global hub for R&D manufacturing as well. So uh, consumer awareness is very much important for that. So all of you attending this uh, uh, webinar have a very important role to play and we'll be happy to all, uh, support with any additional information which you need. So thank you very much.
Thank you, sir. Thank you for the insight uh, on energy storage. Um, we now move on uh, to our next panelist and esteemed speaker, Mr. Vinay Papa, who is the uh, founder and CEO of Warp Power. And uh, he's going to be talking about uh, round the clock power and the issues and the challenges in India. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Sapna. I will present. Yeah, I hope everybody uh, can hear me and uh, the screen is visible. Yeah, it's perfectly visible. Thanks, Jaydeep. Uh, thank you, uh, EJN, Sapna, and uh, Jaydeep for organizing this webinar. Uh, it's great uh, uh, to be part of this and happy to be here. Dr. Rahul Valbalkar is always a very tough act to emulate. And uh, first, he starts with a very, he has a very imposing presence and is quite he makes a very compelling argument for energy storage, and he has been the most visible face for energy storage in India. Um, for, a, for a long, long time, uh, the world of power has been a very staid and dull and boring world, and practically nothing much has happened. Uh, it's uh, the debate around climate change and the emerging technologies that have really made a difference, and the pace of innovation, the pace of technology change right now is immense. If you look at the problem of uh, uh, climate change in a, in a, in a more uh, focused uh, context, uh, there are three or four sectors which contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. The number one is electricity, two is transportation, third is industrial processes, and fourth is agriculture. Of all these four sectors, the one that is the lowest hanging fruit, uh, where which can show us a path to deep decarbonization and where technologies are available to get us to that uh, decarbonization, decarbonization target is electricity. Uh, so how is the energy transition in India playing out? Uh, I'll, uh, so uh, India predominantly has been uh, uh, a coal-based uh, power economy. And if you look at the uh, power capacity that we have today, out of the 3.380 odd gigawatts of power that we have, uh, almost uh, 259, 259 gigawatts is from coal and renewables has just crossed nine, uh, has just crossed 100 gigawatts. It was 94 gigawatts as of March 21. It was indeed a landmark when we crossed the 100 gigawatt mark last year. But look at where we want to. Uh, where we will be by March 2030, if we actually hit the targets that we have set for ourselves. There is very little of uh, uh, coal growth happening and uh, uh, renewable energy goes from 94 to almost 450 gigawatts. That's almost like a four and a half times growth in the next uh, nine years. So that is essentially uh, how the uh, path to deep decarbonization is for the electricity sector. And, uh, uh, if you look at uh, incremental coal capacity additions year on year, every year, um, the CA keeps track of that. And it's very interesting to see that uh, typically we have been having close to, at its peak, it has been close to 20 gigawatts of uh, fresh coal capacity getting added every year. Now it has come down to virtually zero. Virtually no new coal has been built uh, in the last financial year ending March 21. We will still need coal. I will talk about that as to the role of coal in the energy transition as uh, solar, wind, and other renewables uh, take over a large part of our energy mix. But uh, you, you'll, still need, you'll still need coal uh, uh, as a balancing power uh, to even out the intermittency that comes along with uh, uh, the renewables. Uh, there is one school of thought which uh, says that, I mean, in fact, this also finds uh, some echo in the official policy that uh, uh, until we cross the 100 gigawatt mark in renewables uh, in solar alone, the problems of intermittency of solar will not really start surfacing. In, me, in other words, we don't really have to plan for it, talk about storage, talk about balancing until it touches 100 gigawatts. Why is that? Uh, even today, uh, if, uh, the, though in capacity terms, the numbers look very impressive for RE growth. 
in terms of actual energy consumption because of the lower efficiencies of solar and wind we have barely about 11% of the energy consumption in uh, kilowatt hours or units of power is uh, contributed by re, re, uh, renewable energy sources uh, that will not that will definitely change um, and as the percentage of penetration of renewable energy increases in the energy bouquet that we consume uh, these problems of intermittency will start start becoming bigger issues for the grid operators to handle and uh, uh, we would start we would be start, we would be grappling with those issues uh, we need to be grappling with those issues now what is really propelling this energy transition is uh, two things of course there are our sustainability commitments under the paris, uh, paris climate change accord but what is really important uh, and uh, what has really driven the adoption of uh, renewables in the recent past i'm talking about the last decade 2010 onwards when we launched the national solar mission has been the steep and rapid decrease in the uh, in the solar tariffs that uh, we have been seeing in uh, 2010 when the national solar mission was launched the very first tender which was uh, launched to discover the to discover the prices yielded a very high price of about 16 rupees per unit and uh, the tenders today after about 11 years after the uh, launch of the solar mission the prices have fallen to anywhere between 2.3 to 2.4 uh, rupees a unit that's a very very steep fall in fact we have a uh, we have a we have an equivalent of the moore's law um, for uh, fall of solar tariff uh, solar tariffs across the world uh, it's also it's called the swanson's law which says that for every doubling of uh, solar module capacity we have about a 20% drop and that has been a secular drop year on year for the last 11 years and uh, which has been the real reason why the uh, renewables have taken off uh, in the energy mix now let's look at uh, the implications of having more and more renewable energy in the in the, in the energy consumption uh, bouquet that we have today dr rahul balwalkar already uh, brought it brought this out in some detail uh, when he talked about the need for balancing and the role of energy storage but i'll slightly like to go deeper into uh, a bit deeper into these issues before we get on to the the core of the topic which is renewable energy uh, round the clock power If you look at a typical solar plant's load generation profile, which you see on the top left here, uh, solar plants wake up at around six six thirty in the morning in a typical Indian context. Uh, they start ramping up the power, and uh, between six and ten, it kind of reaches a peak at around uh, between uh, between one and two p.m., and then it goes down. And there is in the night there is there is no power. There's no there's no sun. There's no power. and wind also is very typical uh, 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 almost 80% of the annual production of wind happens in the monsoon months between june and september this 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 contributes 80% of the power comes in this four five months and the rest of the year uh, is pretty flat now you but if you look at the load that the grid operator has to handle obviously there this is not in line with the uh, the the whimsical generation trend of both solar and uh, wind Uh, on the bottom left, I've 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 shown here how the All India power demand varies during a typical day. This was taken in October twenty uh, first of October twenty first of October last year. Just a random day, the profiles remain the same pretty much uh, throughout the year. The demand really picks up at six in the morning. This is the peak uh, peak demand uh, ramp up that happens between six and ten a.m. in the morning. And then equally steep ramp up uh, happening between uh, five p.m. to seven p.m. in the evening. and if you look at the problem here that's when the solar is actually declining uh, we have little or no wind and how do we meet this kind of a ramp up in the demand it happens it happens here it happens here so we have had uh, various uh, um, uh, strategies to meet this kind of a thing we have been trying to uh, in a way um, trying to make the elephant dance uh, by asking renewables to be something that something more like coal like the coal is typically flat i mean you when you start a coal plant you can you can have a kind of a flat load profile it's also called base load power now this is what we uh, aim to uh, achieve by a combination of solar wind and storage so we have had two or three approaches to this the auctions that have been coming out by the solar energy corporation of india there have been a combination of wind plus solar wind plus solar plus storage and now the latest is actually to do a reverse blending of uh, costly thermal power with uh, cheaper Uh, cheaper solar cheaper wind and uh, uh, with storage as an option <coughs> uh, 
So let's come to what uh, the RTC tender is all about. So what are we attempting to do here? We are, we are attempting a load profile that is close or very close to a flat baseline profile that you would otherwise get from coal uh, from a coal plant by a combination of solar, wind, uh, coal thermal, and with an optional uh, bat with optional storage. The storage could be uh, agnostic to technologies. It can be lithium batteries. It can be compressed air. It can be any of those 16 or 17 odd technologies that are there in the market today to offer uh, uh, energy storage in this blended kind of a uh, uh, generation source mix. Uh, a few broad uh, kind of uh, uh, the rules of the game, uh, like uh, we have had a couple of tenders and uh, like uh, Sapna said in an introductory speech, can you power one the first around the clock bid? Uh, the RE component of uh, the RE component of uh, the energy mix in a typical RTC tender would have to be at least 51%. So it, it is still majority RE power. The it is not necessary to co-locate solar, wind, thermal all in one place uh, because of uh, the kind of resources that we have. So the, the, the solar resources are great in in Rajasthan. Wind is great in Gujarat. So you can have the wind plant. In uh, Gujarat, is solar, the solar plant in Rajasthan, and have the uh, coal anywhere in, in the country, as long as all these three are connected to the interstate uh, transmission system. Uh, this is a big boon for uh, 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 coal capacity that is actually spare and lying unutilized without any long-term tie-ups. Uh, it is actually it'd be useful for uh, a thermal developer who has that kind of spare capacity to tie up with an RE developer who can set up the solar and wind plant and then participate uh, in this kind of bid as a consortium. Uh, a few other kind of uh, conditions that the uh, bids lay down. We also have a, um, a policy that's governing uh, the RTC bidding paradigm. Uh, you have much more details there. Uh, what it does is, uh, of course, the, the bidding is on a build, own and operate basis. You need to quote a tariff and the person who quotes a lowest uh, tariff will eventually win the capacity. Uh, the, the power purchase agreements are for a period of 20, uh, for a period of uh, 25 years, and uh, the minimum capacity has been reduced from 500 to 250 megawatts. So you need to be you need to bid for uh, bid for 250 megawatts uh, uh, at the minimum. The injection can happen uh, anywhere in the country as long as uh, you are connecting it to the interstate transmission system, and you combine this with the uh, fact that uh, uh, moving the power. Uh, moving clean power or RE power over the ISTS system is currently exempt from all transmission charges. So the locations, uh, the charges, uh, the cost of landed power at the customer's location becomes agnostic to the location of the plant. So you can put your plant in Rajasthan, consume the plant, consume the power in Tamil Nadu. It's the same as uh, uh, having them both in Tamil Nadu. So it's virtually, uh, we kind of made the geography uh, immaterial in the for the purposes of transmission there. Uh, it also says that, uh, now, uh, of course, there is a small concession that has been made. Uh, RTC power in, in uh, uh, RTC power literally would mean 100% availability 24 by 7. Uh, but because since that is not achievable in uh, literally with this kind of a blend, uh, the tender requires uh, the annual and monthly CF is, uh, to be 85%. It's not 80%, it's 85%. Uh, so you're looking at a normative availability exceeding 85% both on an annual basis and also on a monthly basis. And there are very heavy penalties if you fall short of uh, these uh, thresholds. Uh, so basically the bidding happens on a, on, a, on a composite tariff. So you have an RE component to the tariff, a fixed RE component for wind, a fixed RE component for solar, a variable RE component, uh, variable component for the thermal portion. Uh, to take care of uh, changes in uh, transportation costs and changes in fuel cost. And also there's a fixed cost component for thermal also. So there are basically five components of the tariff and there are packages depending on the capacity. And you arrive at a composite uh, tariff and that will decide uh, whoever quotes less on that composite tariff will, uh, will be the winner for the bid. Uh, it has got a lot of uh, features uh, to give the investors uh, comfort around uh, availability, grid availability, offtake uh, guarantees. Uh, there's a lot of detail on that. It's a very investable and bankable uh, power purchase agreement that has been put out. Uh, it has features like uh, uh, deemed compensation in case 
the grid is not available for more than more than 175 hours in a year and in case there is any technical backdown also the generator will get compensated for the technical backdown there is huge amount of comfort in uh, uh, in uh, for the investors to put in money uh, at the end uh, so is this going to be the answer to the uh, variable renewable energy integration problem it's one of the i would say it's one of the many measures uh, there is still uh, there are the various policy tools you can actually start controlling the demand you can have uh, demand side management other tools also are available but this is one 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 big step uh, into making uh, integrating renewable energy into the grid it is strictly not uh, rtc power it is because with availability of 85% you are still short of the 100% mark uh, we still don't have the dispatchability of thermal uh, uh, given the must run requirements of solar and wind uh, the grid uh, the grid uh, code requires that solar and wind plants can't be backed down you need to offtake whatever power they generate and whenever they generate the plant load factors will be very typical to will be very typical to what a thermal plant would otherwise give uh, and given the multiple generation locations it may not be strictly a hybrid in its true sense so you have you can have a co location as an option but i would expect that uh, given the uh, resource rich uh, uh, given the dispersed uh, concentration of resources from a solar and wind point of view the plants also would get dispersed solar would go to a place where the best uh, solar conditions are available wind would go to the place where the best wind speeds are available uh, and as long as it's on the same network uh, I, uh, it, it may not be a hybrid in the true sense uh, dispersed injection of power through each of these generation sources also mean could mean that the land cost could be higher uh, you need to build transmission lines at each of these places of injection and permitting all costs could also be higher uh, but it's like i said these are the small flaws in otherwise uh, uh, otherwise uh, feasible and uh, practical paradigm to integrate variable renewable energy into the grid um, that's about what i have to say uh, over to you sapna Thank you so much, sir. I am sure our participants uh, would have really uh, you know, gained a lot from that insight into round the clock power, which is now an ongoing discussion. Uh, we now move on to uh, our third panelist for the day and esteemed speaker, Madam Charmin Char Sharma. And uh, she is actually the uh, senior managing partner at Observing Ecotech, which offers a zero res residue waste conversion plants. And uh, ma'am has actually, uh, you know, she's been awarded the Outstanding Entrepreneur Award for Sustainable Technology in 2021 for her performance and impact in the RE sector. So we're very uh, happy to have you. And uh, ma'am, over to you about uh, waste to energy technologies and the issues and challenges that India faces currently with regards to waste to energy. Over to you, ma'am. Ma'am, we can't hear you. You've muted yourself. Can you please unmute yourself? Thank you. You just have to unmute yourself. Ma'am, please unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Opening the presentation, then that thing is going off or what I don't know. Is it still, am I still with audible? Yeah, you're audible now. Okay. Yeah. So um, just to uh, say hello to everybody and uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I think it's very uh, essential to speak about the various uh, sources of renewable energy. And uh, as we uh, spoke earlier, uh, the other participants also mentioned the paucity of the resources. Now, I want to make a point that waste is a huge resource uh, uh, waiting to be used. So we have uh, the figures that the world generates 2.1 billion tons of municipal solid waste only. That does not include various plastics and packaging materials and the biomedical waste and all this that has increased in the uh, you know, uh, uh, in the two years that the world has been affected by the COVID pandemic. So the quantity of fuels 
that can be continuously uh, harvested from processing waste in pyrolysis plants is a humongous amount that can support the shortfall of the solar and the wind, you know, because you're uh, going to collect liquid fuel, uh, carbon black, which is low smoke, high carbon purity coal and gas. And all three can be easily utilized for uh, other, you know, to function other utilities like uh, generation or desalination plants. And there is nil uh, CO2 emissions from the uh, pyrolysis. So this is a picture of the pyrolysis plant that we have set up in Vishakhapatnam. This is a working plant. You can see that the shop floor is clean and the waste is shredded and continuously I may converted. Carmen, yes. may I interrupt you because we cannot see your presentation. So let, let, let me uh, share it from my screen. Yeah, please, that will be yeah, very okay. Just give me one sec. I'll just start okay. sharing it from my screen. One sec, I'm trying to get out of this now. I'm not able to do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, just give me a minute. I'll just do it. Not, not yes. a problem. Should I click the share screen here? Yeah, if you do that, it may work uh, for you. But I'll, let me also just open this. Yeah, is that? Yeah, it's working now. That's perfect. Yeah, OK. So I think except that I'm at the last slide instead of the first one. So let me just go up and yeah. So I was uh, saying the first of all, the, the resource, the waste as an available resource material, not only a resource material that is already a humongous problem in handling waste. So the plants that we are offering, you put unsegregated waste. So you don't have a problem with manual segregation of waste in the context of COVID related issues. And uh, as you can see, the shop floor is clean, the waste is continuously uh, shredded and fed into the react into a pyrolysis reactor. And at 400 to 500 degrees temperature, it continuously converts to oil and gas and uh, what we call carbon black or biochar which is low smoke, high purity, high density of purity of carbon coal. So all these resources can be used to run other plants, other generation, or even to be supplied individually to, to restructure the economies of the rural areas where people have been uh, coming back to their homes and they have no sources. So just to share that the, uh, this is what actually happens is actual uh, photographs from the plant taken in May 21. This is the waste. As you can see, there's all kind of stuff in it. And the byproducts the, are the oil and the carbon black, the moisture, and of course, the gases in the gas balloon, as you can see here. And uh, the, we use the gas also to fire the uh, uh, eaters of the reactor. So we save on electricity. Now, the, there are various technologies that can be used. And this is the recent global industry, uh, one of the recent reports. So the value of waste to wealth is now 390 million in 2016 and gone far higher now. What I need to get everybody's attention to is the various technologies used. So there's gasification, there's pyrolysis, there's depolymerization, and there's incineration. The problems of incineration and the carbon emissions, that is, everybody's very familiar with that. 
I want to make a point that pyrolysis is the largest sector, as you can see, because it is the safest and cleanest method of converting all kinds of waste into useful energy. There is zero emissions from the, uh, from the process and there is no post-process residue because there is no incineration of materials. At high temperature, the materials convert to hydrocarbons. So all the plastics convert to petroleum products, all the biomass gives gas and moisture, and what doesn't become liquid fuel and gas becomes carbon black with a high purity of carbon. So everything now in the, con in the example of e-waste, there's a huge humongous quantities of e-waste that everybody is aware of. So you process the e-waste in such a plant and your plastics and everything get converted to liquid fuel. Then you're left with the carbon black, which is maybe one fourth of your total. So if you have started with 10 tons, you're ending up with, let us say, two tons of carbon. And from that carbon, therefore, it's very easy to harvest the precious metals and everything that is uh, to be harvested from the e-waste. And the rest converts to, uh, now I want to share the, this point that the, the viability of such a plant, if somebody is using, so all the waste, 100% of waste fed into the plant will be converted without any post-process residue, no effluent, nothing. So the plastics, because they have high calorific value, yield, yield the highest amount of liquid fuel. So pyrolysis oil, when we first three years ago, I did an ROI calculation and I took the sale of pyrolysis fuel as 20 to 30 rupees, which is now uh, having a demand at 60 rupees. So the whole commercial viability has also increased of such a plant. And the, the main uh, purpose is to get rid of the waste in a safe manner there is zero carbon emissions. I'm giving you the emission standards of our plants recently done. So particulate matter is nil. Hydrochloric acid is 0 0.3 as 3% to other plants. Benzene is minus 1.2. There is nil, nil, nil carbon monoxide. There's very little methane and ethane, which can also be harvested and used. So why the pyrolysis-based plants are needed? And uh, the, I've already gone through the sector, uh, the global sector of the various uh, technologies and the demand that the type of technology that is going to be used. So I've given you the emission standards. So this is a whole story waiting to happen. There is no incineration. There is the utilization of waste, so waste to wealth. And uh, so there is, uh, uh, however, in many of the forums where we're, when we talk of renewable energy, waste, the waste to energy is not mentioned at all. And everybody asks me, oh, but what are you doing? And where is the waste going? And you don't have to segregate. Even the wet waste can go into the plant. Everything can go into the plant. So. The point is that this has to be a richly de defined sector because it is a success story waiting to happen and waiting to support the other renewable energy methods that are, especially in the context of the biomedical waste. There's the biomedical waste has a lot of plastics, a lot of also contaminated uh, body parts or whatever you may think. Uh, you know, that can spread disease. So you don't even have to touch it. It just goes into the plant and it is all processed at high temperatures and that is the end of it. Now, uh, so the e-waste, I've given the examples, the paper industry, these are the people who are recently getting in touch with us uh, for setting up the plants. And uh, so my request is that everybody look at this as a huge opportunity waiting to happen to entrepreneurs, to industry, to the plastic manufacturers, because see, it is because of plastics and plastic packaging that a lot of crucial, important life-saving medicines have reached every corner of the world. So this new dialogue of treating plastic as the demon, I do not agree to that. You make the plastic, you make best 
best use of it. You process it, you take your liquid fuel back and again you make the plastic. So that's the, the message I want to give is the utilization of waste. So I don't want to take more time. I would rather give time to people who would like to discuss or question or engage. So over to you, Sapna. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your presentation. And I'm sure uh, our audience would be really, really enlightened on, you know, waste to energy, which is uh, right now, uh, currently, because of the COVID crisis, it's uh, it's, uh, it's a huge opportunity. Yes. Yeah, and it's a huge opportunity and we need to treat it, uh, treat it well. And uh, please uh, direct your questions to our panelists uh, in the Q&A box and we'll take it up uh, once uh, Mr. Jain uh, is... Uh, over uh, finishes his presentation. So now uh, we will move on uh, to uh, Mr. Sunil Jain, who was uh, the uh, CEO and executive director of uh, Hero Fu Future Energies and is currently uh, the operating partner, uh, Energy Transition at SR Capital. So we'll be speaking about uh, how rooftop solar has not really made a mark in India and has not really you know, touch the figures that it was expected to. And a lot of uh, hope was uh, from, uh, you know, 40 gigawatts is, uh, was expected. But like I mentioned in my PPT, uh, the figures have been uh, pretty uh, sad. So he will be talking on uh, rooftop solar. And uh, so I'll, I'll just share his presentation from uh, my side. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Man. May I request Charmaine to stop sharing her screen, please? Yeah. Thanks. OK, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. And of course, Sapna has given me a topic which needs a lot of introspection within the country and with the industry as to what has gone wrong and why we haven't been as successful in rooftop as the world has been. Uh, just to give you a perspective that the country of a size of Germany, which probably is one, not even one tenth in terms of size and the number of population, has got almost 40 gigawatts of rooftop. In fact, Germany started the trend. You can give credit to them for you know, popularizing rooftop as a means of business for people, as a means of pension for people. They subsidized it and they ensured that the utilities were more forthcoming in doing the rooftop. Unfortunately for us, India also set a target of 40 gigawatt, keeping in mind that we are a far larger country and therefore we could be definitely able to do that 40 gigawatt by 2022. Well, we did not know that there are many players and many actors in this game in India, unlike Germany. And we started faltering, falling and almost crawling to achieve a target, which is we have achieved just one-tenth of the original forecasted target, which is a sad story. But well, what went wrong and why it went wrong, we'll discuss about that. But there is a core problem in the Indian power sector, which gets reflected everywhere. My previous speakers also have talked about many other things. But the core problem is the utilities. Uh, you know, this slide you can change, Sapna, you can go to the next slide. See, let, the biggest problem in India is that our utilities are not profitable. And the utilities have a bent of mind where they are supposed to subsidize the poor consumers of electricity in the country. And when I say poor, it is almost 50% of the population or the connections what utilities have are subsidized. We are the only country in the world where 
a large consumer who is a mass consumer pays a higher tariff compared to a small consumer who consumes only few units generally the rule of law is that there is economies of scale and somebody who is buying in bulk should get a lower tariff but in our country the is the other way around and therefore people are subsidizing the cost of the poor consumer so the crux of the problem is that the financials of utilities are very poor and what happens is when you start doing rooftop across industries across commercial building across large houses what you do is you start taking away the high paying consumers of the utilities and they will be stranded with the low paying consumer which will worsen their finances and what is the result they retaliate they start putting non tariff barriers they put supply side barriers there are a lot of barriers they start creating you would not even imagine how innovative our bureaucrats and utilities can be in creating barriers for us you can even not even think of those things so you have got 29 states each one almost like a country in itself and you've got 29 policies regulations to counter in each state no state has got a uniform policy and just to tell you that if you have a uniform policy of the center they will not adopt because power is a concurrent subject states can have their own laws and rules which is further aggravated by the so called in inverted commas independent regulators who actually are their master's voice his master's voice is they have been appointed by the state and they would always prefer to go by the state's uh, demand rather than going by the rule of the law gujarat has been probably one of the most pro uh, you remain in that slide only gujarat is probably one of the most progressive states in terms of policy regulations or for that matter the utilities are profitable but let me tell you this gujarat becomes very regressive when it comes to you trying to sell power directly to their consumers tamil nadu at one point of time used to be very progressive but then as far as rooftop is concerned they became regressive they did not allow you uh, grid connections beyond a certain kilowatt hour maharashtra in fact went to the extreme extent of shutting down plants not allowing open access creating high open access charges so that the rooftop became unviable so the story goes on and on and this chart reflects very clearly how badly we are in fact odisha is the only state which has got a high green only one high green in which is in terms of including exemption waivers you know otherwise every state the policies are not conducive so what has happened is government came out with a net metering policy now let me tell you what the net metering means exactly net metering means is that if you generate solar power say you are generating 100 kilowatt on your roof but you consume 80 so 20 surplus that 20 goes to the government or to the utility but when you get your bill 80 self consumed suppose you consume 120 units 20 from the grid and 20 what you banked so you will get a bill only for 20 what states did was they all did away with the net metering concept and brought in a concept of gross metering where they said that any surplus power you send to the grid it will be sold at a x price and that will not be your power anymore so effectively you are generating cheap power for the grid now that is where the whole thing collapsed because on a sunday you are out on a holiday you are out you will be banking those powers factories are closed on sundays offices are closed on saturday and sunday where does that power go the power goes to the utility and that power the other guy should be able to withdraw which is banked with them or it should be adjusted into his bill 
and that is called net weight gain. What everybody did was that maximum capacity is 10 kilowatt for net weight gain. Beyond that, you can't do it. And therefore, this two step forwards, one step backwards, this thing continued. And that is the reason why we never won a race in Olympics, you know, because we learn from our bureaucrats that you go forward and then you go backwards. Another point, government's target of 40 gigawatt was ambitious. As it happens, the government is right. I believe that you should have ambitious target. Even if you fall slightly below, you would have achieved something great, which is reflecting in 100 gigawatt renewables which we have achieved in spite of not doing 40 gigawatt in um, rooftop. So to that extent, I would give a lot of credit to the government. Another point which we must consider from India's perspective, because you know we try to copy some of the things which may not be practically possible in India. We Indians, demographically and geographically, if you look at it, if we have a roof, our houses area is very small. An average household is not more than 100 square yard, which is 1,000 square feet or 900 square feet roof. And in that roof, we have to do a lot of things. You know, the personal things of the house. We've got a water tank. We've got place to dry clothes. We've got, and we love our roofs. Unlike Europe and other places, we've got a lot of slanting roofs. We don't have that. We've got concrete flat roofs. So to install a rooftop on such small roofs itself is a challenge. Therefore, the area available for small roofs is insignificant. People would generally uh, install one or two kilowatts. That is the best they would do. Or maybe three kilowatt hour. And they don't see too much of value in that. And what has happened, you have barred the large roofs to, from doing rooftop. It is happening. If actually, if you see 4 gigawatt, the smaller rooftops would be very, very insignificant. I don't think so. It would be more than 500 megawatts. The rest is all large rooftops. You may hear that roof. there were specialized rooftop companies who said on the starting of the business that we will do only rooftop. But what happened? They realized that that is, model will not work. So all of them went into the CIA segment, setting up large projects on ground, selling power directly to the consumer, commercial and industrial users. Okay, so we have a problem. What is the solution? The solution is that let's make a win-win situation, both for the generator, for the consumer and the utility. Now, a typical consumer who consumes a power more than, say, in a month, if somebody is consuming more than uh, 500 units or 600 units, would end up paying anything between 5 to 6 rupees. Today, a cost of generating rooftop power is around 3 rupees, depending on the location, because it will depend on how much you can generate from a particular size of a plant. Because eastern region you will generate low, western and northern regions would be better off. Or even southern regions would be better off. Northern, extreme northern would be poor. What we should do is that if three rupees is the cost to the consumer, he is saving his money. The generator who puts up the rooftop and who is doing it on a, you know, RESCO model where he generates and he only collects tariff. Then the consumer is agnostic. Consumer pays three rupees or four rupees, whatever the tariff is negotiated. The generator of that power should now start building in a rupee or 80 paisa into the tariff, which should be given as a subsidy to the uh, discount, saying that, okay, you are losing some part of the consumer. You don't have to do anything. You're not paying any charge. You're not generating, buying power. I am giving you 80 paisa from my side for allowing me to do a rooftop. What it does is the consumer saves less. He, he will still save. He'll save a, a rupee and 20 paisa. Generator will get his return and utility gets his return. We make a tripartite model where everybody lives happily thereafter. 
and therefore utilities will be more forthcoming in the new policies to ensure that you know rooftop is installed solar i again repeat along with battery is the best way to be deployed in a distributed manner a large scale grid connected solar is not the right model anywhere in the world but because rooftop cannot scale up that much then you have no option but to go for large scale grid connected project we are already seeing what happened in california you had blackout in california because there was so much of roof, uh, grid connected power and you had a, a duck curve and the grid collapsed and that's how the battery storage came in so let us do a distributed model for the solar rooftop the, another problem which rooftop faces is funding no banks institutions are willing to fund we had a headlines of world bank giving 100 million dollars to uh, state bank of india for funding rooftop projects what it did they funded projects but they funded a triple a rated or a a rated company which was doing that rooftop project on its balance sheet to get tax incentive it did not matter to them need to know how many rooftop business out of that 100 million dollars they gave it to the resco producers who were selling setting up rooftop project and selling only power negligible pnb got similar line it never saw the light of the day so rooftop funding is a challenge and my suggestion is that rooftop should become an asset financing rather than a project financing when i say asset financing i mean the way you buy a car you buy a house you buy a fridge it is financed very easily same way rooftop should be financed but that will only happen if the policies are conducive and there is a win win model people will come and finance it as an asset because they know that if tomorrow this guy does not buy electricity i'll pick it up and put it up somewhere else it is something similar that he, they take custody of your car if you don't pay them we have to think out of the box for a country like us which has to take care of the poor we cannot go with that and we cannot let the utilities bear the brunt they don't have the money any which way so what happens is they don't pay the large generators any which way so of course rooftop is a burden for them so we need to find a solution one of the solution is this whether that is 60 paisa 80 paisa or a rupee is a matter of discussion and a modeling but this is what it is maybe government can come in with a model of contract for difference where they say that okay i will subsidize you for a certain period of time to sustain the cost fall for the because government once rooftop comes in does not have to invest in that last mile connectivity to a large extent because then the connectivity can be much lower the cost of infrastructure can be much lower and last but not the least we need to have quality epc players in rooftop who can start and guarantee that project will last the life of the 25 years today what has happened is we got mushroom of 500 600 epc players who, who people don't know will survive next three years or not so this is from my side sapna yes yeah, sure thank you sir and uh, i will stop sharing the screen yeah any question i'm happy sir. to sure so uh, now that uh, all our esteemed speakers have uh, given their presentation and their points of view and detailed uh, insight into uh, their specific uh, topics that they were talking on uh, the floor is now open to uh, questions uh, there are a lot of questions in the q and a box so should we start with that so ma'am this is addressed to you uh, this is a wonderful ppt uh, the question is uh, from monica mandal and she says why has priolysis not been why has it not been uh, been taken up and is it economical with other wte plants investors are generally bothered by the uneconomical returns so do we have success stories here 
Ma'am, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank okay. You. So, can you hear me? Yeah. So, to say that uh, the point is pyrolysis is in the old days, the plants came from China and uh, pyrolysis is there should is conversion of material at high temperature in the absence of oxygen. So absence of oxygen is the big point because without oxygen, they, they, therefore there is no burning of material. So now uh, the old plants came from China, apparently that was before I was in the sector. And uh, so there was oxygen getting into the reactors and causing what was called a backfire. So now we have set up the running plant in Vishakhapatnam, the conversion of material is there. Why it is not picking up is very interesting. One is that the, um, as other speakers have also pointed out earlier, that our whole mechanism of, you know, granting licenses, understanding, pollution control boards, you know, all these people have to also update their data to fit in the new and efficient technologies. That's why I have put up the graph showing why uh, pyrolysis is 90% of the growth sector of a $500 billion industry. In India, we are still saying, what is pyrolysis? So that, therefore, I've put up the plant at my own cost in Vishakhapatnam. As uh, the other panelist also said, nobody gives us money. Nobody wants to invest. Now you can see it working and now the interest is coming. So it's a globally recognized technology for its efficiency and safety and addressing the sustainable development goals. Because from my one 10 ton a day plant, 3.5 metric tons of CO2 will not go into the atmosphere. Yeah, so any other question? Yeah, ma'am, there is one more question for you from Kanchan Srivastava of the dialogue. So she says, congratulations, Ms. Sharma, for your wonderful presentation Thank and you. contribution to the RE sector. This looks like a personal effort. Uh, the, she goes on to say that when, when you see the mountains of garbage in Mumbai, Surat and Delhi, you immediately realize that a lot needs to be done mainly by the government. I wish to know what Delhi and other states are doing in this regard. Yes, I think a lot has to be done by the government. I have in the last five years made presentations to every state government and every government I've visited the Vashi, you know, 11,000 tons of waste lying there in Lucknow, so every state. But there is no mechanism for the state, as the other speakers have also pointed out, it, to support this effort, you know. And if a private player comes into it, there is no assurance that he will get the waste. Somebody is removing the plastics and selling it separately. Somebody is selling something separately. So we do not have a foolproof system. Why my Vishakhapatnam plant I set up for the Navy is because of this, because the estimations are correct. If they say it is tens and tons a day, they will give you 10 tons a day. Nobody is removing the plastic from the waste, nobody. But we are looking at this model in the private sector where people will set up the plants and uh, use the byproducts for sub supporting other renewable energy efforts. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I move on to the other question now by Jane C. Samuel, uh, who says, uh, can an individual afford battery storage? So is there no, in that case, is there no need to connect to the grid? So uh, Rahul, sir, yeah. would you like to take up that question? Sure. Yeah, so again, there are many off-grid microgrids which use uh, uh, batteries. So uh, again, depending on how much you value your energy, it is possible. Uh, but right now, I think the low-hanging fruit is in terms of using it in a grid interactive way. So not in a form where you will have like 24 by 7 power, uh, because there then the cost starts uh, going higher. But if you can use it as a grid interactive way where you can reduce the demand on the grid during peak time, use some renewable energy during daytime, and then also use it uh, 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 when the renewable energy is not available, then that is possible. So right now what the way we see it is like many, especially 
uh, individuals or commercial industrial customers can start using this for uh, at least 25% to 50% of their energy and start uh, a head start on that. And then as you uh, uh, end up uh, seeing the prices continue to drop down, the technologies improve, then maybe in another five year, 10 year, you can start looking at it as a 24 by seven complete off grid. But uh, already again, in regions where there are, if you are using say diesel as your backup, and you are right now running your system on diesel, then yes, it is already actually cost effective and you can use renewable plus storage uh, for 100% uh, uh, energy as well. But if you have access to grid, then uh, uh, economically you would uh, like maybe try to reduce it some part of the consumption. Thank you, sir. So, and move on to the next question, uh, which says, uh, when according to you will we be reaching having solar plus battery like ups for each house this is from g balaji so in fact this is one of the fastest growing markets right now although right now majority of these installations are still happening with lead acid batteries uh, so what is happening is many uh, regions people are used to having an inverter at home and when they are buying it along with solar panel, they are getting certain GST reduction, uh, which is uh, available with solar system. And that seems to be driving this penetration. But if you are really using it as a solar plus storage, then actually the levelized cost of energy is cheaper with some of the advanced batteries, although the upfront cost will be slightly higher. But in terms of using it daily basis, you get actually lower levelized cost for that. So it is already happening. And the only thing which is right now preventing it is a little bit financing. So once we start having financing accessible to consumers where they can uh, uh, get uh, loans for it, maybe start paying it in a uh, levelized tariff kind of rate, I think we are going to see a tremendous uh, uh, increase. I think Sunil Ji and his uh, presentation mentioned about some of the non-tariff barriers with uh, uh, utilities have been putting in for rooftop solar. So we feel that actually so for anyone who has access to sufficient rooftop, so rooftop, I think solar plus battery will actually get rid of many of those issues with the uh, uh, discount and again, for discounts, then it is fine because again, uh, apart from just the financial aspect, what Sunil ji mentioned, I think it is also fair from discount because if you just keep on adding uh, renewables on a distributed side and use grid as a backup and then start expecting that you get paid full net metering, then just practically as a business, it is not viable because when you are buying power from uh, discount, you are paying small part of that as an energy cost but also you are paying a significant part of that for network cost and other costs. So when you are feeding back energy, you getting like a full price, it's just not economically viable anywhere. Uh, it was fine for initial years for supporting renewable energy, but almost in every region, including developing countries, utilities have actually protested for it. And most of the regulators have actually stopped giving net metering. Uh, so we have to find out an alternative to that. And there, I think uh, solar plus storage makes a perfect sense. I just wanted to add to that, Sapna, if you allow me. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Please go ahead. The, uh, the day when a residential Indian customer can go completely off-grid with a viable solar plus battery is still some distance away. The reason for this, like Rahul has said, and like what Sunil Jain had already said, is the, uh, the viability and the economics of it. We, when we talk about uh, four-hour storage, the prices are already at around five rupees plus. And most residential customers pay much less than that. Uh, this, the situation in India is very typical. Uh, like if you go to Australia, the residential customers pay one of the highest tariffs in the world. And that's the kind of situation which is conducive for solar battery adoption. And it has got the highest penetration of uh, uh, rooftops among households anywhere in the world. Close to 70-70% of Australian households have already gone for solar plus uh, solar, and some of them have gone for solar plus batteries also. So the 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 uh, subsidized residential tariffs are a big uh, hurdle for this kind of a uh, massive adoption uh, that can happen. And but if you look at look at the situation worldwide, the the biggest drivers of uh, hybrid storage, solar plus battery, is behind the meter residential and commercial storage. So we we uh, our our situation is completely different compared to the rest of the world, and uh, we will be quite some distance away from getting there. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, there's one more question for Rahul, sir, and Vinay. Uh, I mean, so Monica Mondal has said, uh, thank you, Rahul and Vinay. I have been trying to find out how much has the introduction of RE sources, how have they, how is the introduction of RE sources taken away the pressure from the power grid in terms of the load curve? So, anyway, Rahul or Vinay, sir. I, I, I'll just say, I think the, yeah, the, 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 it is not phrased correctly. In fact, the addition of RE actually stresses the grid operators. It stresses the grid. It doesn't take the load away from the grid. Okay, so with the with the whole uh, the whole paradigm about solar wind hybrids, solar wind and storage is about making it making life uh, easy for the grid operator to manage load on one side and the demand load on one side and generation on one side. So uh, any increase in RE uh, is going to make the task difficult, and uh, RTC tenders and all these things that we are be doing are a way are a kind of a, a step in that direction to try to mitigate the integration challenges of variable renewable energy to the grid. Rahul, if you want to add anything, please do. But my neighbor has started doing some household work, so I hope uh, there is not too much disturbance. But uh, 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 yeah, I agree with uh, what uh, uh, Vinay has mentioned. At the same time, actually, I think with the uh, RE, uh, uh, there is also, again, in terms of just general energy availability, uh, it has definitely helped. and. Now I think we have gone in last sort of eight years from a energy deficit to energy surplus. So from that point of view, uh, it has uh, helped the grid. But uh, Vina is absolutely right that the key challenge now with growing uh, RE is the flexibility of the grid. And that's the area where uh, we need to uh, start looking at these type of uh, hybrid solutions. Again, Sunil was one of the first ones to start doing the hybrid projects in India with uh, Hero Future Energy. Uh, unfortunately, most of the IPPs uh, for, again, many cases, valid financial reasons have actually tried to stay away from it. And they have taken the approach that, oh, anything with storage adds a cost. So let me stay away from it and let's wait for a cost to go down. So unless we start actually valuing the power quality, the reliability uh, as a consumer, it is going to be very difficult for these things to get happened, right? So I think technically, I think almost every IPP in the world, uh, uh, especially the renewable IPPs, have started paying a lot more attention to storage. If you see in developing countries, uh, IPPs like AES, NextEra, Res America, which are global leaders in this area, uh, uh, all of them have now actually bigger portfolio now with RE plus storage than just standalone RE. Uh, in India, I think we are trying to educate many of these IPPs, uh, but some of these issues and reliance on just discoms where the price point becomes the only criteria, not the dispatchability because discoms feel comfortable in maybe in um, many cases outside major cities curtailing customers without any impunity. Uh, so unless we change that and we start putting value on that, uh, it will remain a challenge. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, thank you for your responses, sir. I move on to the next question by Saubhik Das now. Mr. Jain, this is for you. It says Karnataka tried rooftop solar through DISCOM, but the response is not great so far. So would you like to address that, sir? Mr. Jain? The moment a rooftop is linked to a utility, it will not get a response. The reason is that the policies can change over a period of time. And Karnataka has been notorious for that, even in the past. They promoted a rooftop policy where they were paying a tariff of almost 7 rupees and 9 rupees. And majority of the PPS got cancelled. So rooftop can never be linked to utility. Let me tell you this. If rooftop it has to be done, it has to be done by an individual. That is what we have to promote. And as I said in my earlier view, that we must give some pie to the utility so that it comes on board. So please do not go with this, uh, you know, utility trying to encourage you to put up on your roof and I will buy the power. I think that that model does not work. So best is you do your self-consumption. And as Rahul said, if... And even Vinay was provocating that if you can have a firm power in your home with a battery and a levelized cost, which is five or six rupees with solar plus battery, well, it's a great, great thing to have. I would do away with the grid. I don't want grid then. But the problem is, if you have to have a battery and you need to solar, 
then you must have sufficient solar which can charge your battery as well as power your phone during the uh, generating time. So India does not have that luxury. So then again, it will what will happen is this will move to the richer people. The poor may not be able to do that. So that challenge will continue to remain. As I said, Indian household area, average household area is very small. Thank you. Uh, so there is recommend a rooftop with Karnataka policy. Sure. Thank you, sir. There's one more uh, question for you, uh, Jain, sir. It says, you mentioned Indian houses and roofs are too small to support the rooftop solar system. So what is the optimum rooftop size in the Indian context, keeping the daily needs in consideration, which is probably assuming that it's lesser than the needs of those uh, people staying in Europe? Yeah, so I'll tell you two things. You know, Indian roofs are flat roofs. You've got a cemented roof. Whereas in Europe, you will see majority of the houses have got sloping roofs, which are of no use except because that has been built to take into account the, uh, their uh, climate conditions like snow and all. The roofs, they always had sloping roofs. Those roofs are ideal for putting a rooftop. You know, it's very easy and cheap to install. Like you have sheds in the factories. In India, a typical roof, you know, actually the idea is you need around 75. Earlier, you need to do 75 square feet area is required for one kilowatt installation. Now, 75 square feet area, when in your total house, probably people are living in 200 square feet house. So one kilometer, kilowatt hour is the, not a great thing. Nobody would install one, except for the poor people in the villages, will just put up a panel on his, you know, what you call a village home, and he gets at least a bulb to, and a, yeah. So, at, ideally, I would say, if you have a seven to 800 square feet area of a roof, then you could probably install two to three kilowatt hour. That's what my view is. But Indians, we love our roofs. We, we don't want to Clutter our roof with rooftop. That's the problem. Because ultimately, it will get installed on the roof and we don't have sloping roofs. Another solution was that you increase the height of the rooftop and you know you leave the roof for the people underground to work they wanted. But then it causes the problem of operation and maintenance. So that did not work out. It increases the cost also. But typically, I would say at, I know in square yard, a typically 250 square yard house would be a good place to start with. Okay. So, uh, okay. So we move on to the next question, which says that uh, medium and uh, small uh, in enterprises are paying rupees seven to eight kilowatt hour for years now. They will be happy to pay rupees five per kilowatt hour in the OPEX model. And discounts can act as surety in between uh, lenders and consumers. Uh, the problem, as pointed out by you, is ratings of the MSMEs. However, why has such a model not been very successful in Karnataka? This is from Saubhik Das. I think, Mr. Jain, I think it's addressed to you. Yeah, you know, Sim, what I'll tell you is there are two types of ratings. One, you are asking for a discount to come in as a guarantor. Their rating itself is C. They don't pay. So how does it matter if he becomes a guarantor? Number two, the bank will not finance. Even today, an MSME gets a ba uh, bank loan purely because of government intervention. If it was to go on its rating, I doubt half the MSMEs would, won't get a loan. So as an installer who's going to take the risk of supplying power to you, and tomorrow you don't pay me, how does it work? The discount guarantee will not happen. Discount can only guarantee me. We propose to the government that if I put up a rooftop on anybody's industrial factory, if he does not pay me, the utility can cut off his power. But government said, sorry, that's a private contract between two parties. We will not become a party to that. Because what will happen is if that happens, you can have hundreds of litigations going into the courts. The and the MSMEs are not willing to give you a letter of credit or a guarantee or a bank guarantee which I believe is not correct. They should do it because they, in the long run, are going to benefit much more. Much, much more. They'll recover that cost fully. 
So model is right. What he's saying is right, but actual ground implementation is not taking place because meeting of minds is not taking place. Thank you, sir. Uh, this question uh, is from Pragati Prabha, and it says, can a small city like Bhuvaneshwar be totally dependent on renewable energy? Can you please explain the cost factor, challenges, and opportunities? Vinay, sir, would you like to? Yeah, yeah. Sapna, sir. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Sapna, I may have sorry. to leave. I have a flight to catch. Sorry, Sapna? sir. Sorry, I sir. I have a flight to catch. I have a flight to catch. Okay, okay, sir. Sure, Thank sure. You. Please, please. Thank you. We'll we'll send you okay, questions. Uh, yeah, Sapna, I'll also leave because I think uh, there's no more interaction. You can always ask people to connect with me. Yeah. There are questions for you also. Okay, fine. We'll send it over mail. Yeah. No, if you want, I'll wait for a little longer. Yeah, okay. Just five more minutes. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, Thank Sapna, you. back Thank to your you. question, you. question okay. about uh, net zero cities, right? Why can't Bhuvaneshwar be one? Yeah, yeah, if you look at, uh, there's actually a, uh, an agency which tracks uh, net zero commitments across the world. I believe there are at least, as of last count, there are 37 cities which have committed to a net zero kind of a commitment at the city level. And there are con the countries which have come go gone and made a net zero commitment. In fact, there was a lot of pressure on India to make a net zero commitment by a particular date in the recent, recent conference which the US president uh, presided over. But we consciously kept away from making that kind of commitment at a country level. But nothing stops us from making this kind of a commitment for a liberal. Uh, Bhubaneshwar is already way up there. Bhubaneshwar is the only city today where you, where the tap from your water is actually portable. You can actually drink from the tap. And uh, it's a clean city. Uh, it's a lovely city. And it is kind of an, uh, uh, it has an evolved kind of perspective on things. I'm sure we should, uh, we should, we should be able to do that. And uh, it's not difficult. Uh, a city like Hyderabad, for example, would not be consuming more than about 1,200 to 1,300 megawatts. And uh, all it needs is uh, uh, planning and uh, uh, a little bit of planning to make sure that what you consume is actually from uh, clean energy sources. And uh, it's a good way of uh, uh, incentivizing RE adoption, especially the grid scale RE adoption and where uh, solar rooftops will also have a role, a big role to play in uh, getting to net zero. It is feasible, but I'm surprised it is not really caught on, uh, at least at the municipalities and the municipal corporations. They could start out with that, work closely with the DISCOM to make sure that our cities uh, become net zero. And just to add to that, uh, when I, uh, yeah, I agree that I think many cities can take some of these initiatives and this is the area where actually e-mobility can actually complement because electric vehicles can act as, as a flexible load which can take uh, a higher uh, penetration of renewables as well. So apart from adding storage as a stationary storage, as a fixed storage, uh, basically every electric vehicle is basically storage on wheels. So if we can plan the electric vehicle fleets properly, it will also reduce actually the uh, carbon emission and uh, other air pollution from the transportation sector. At the same time, it can also enable higher penetration of renewables at a uh, city level. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Rahul, sir, for the responses. We are taking one last question, ma'am. This is for you, and then we'll wind up, and the other questions, we'll send it through mail, and yeah, we'll sure. get it sure. because we're running out of time. So it says, it's from Gen Z Samuel again. It says, ma'am, you mentioned there is no waste, but the presentation says that the waste can be used for building material. Could you please clarify? Building and what about the cost factor? See, the, I don't know, uh, there is certain waste which, you know, for example, pet bottles. Pet bottles, for some reason, do not yield anything in the pyrolysis plant. They can be safely converted, but they cannot give you any output. The PP, the PPE will give you very high 60-70% fuel output. So things like pet are being reused and made into bricks and used for roads or buildings. So that is one use of the pet bottles. But if you have anybody has seen the waste, you can see how in what condition the waste comes. It's all food and plastic and bottle and everything mixed in it. The cost, uh, according to the size of the plant. Now, there are two costs we can talk of. One is the cost of conversion of the material. So conversion of material is coming to about 15 to 20 rupees per kilo 
So because waste is coming to the plant at zero cost, your raw material is nil cost, you're running the plant cost is there and you're converting that zero raw material cost into a useful thing. So the cost of the electricity and the machinery, the 10 crore plant is coming to, let us say, 15 to 20 rupees. And pyrolysis oil is showing a demand and people are wanting to buy it at 60 rupees because diesel has gone to 100 rupees. So the costing will keep varying, but the point is that your cost of conversion can come lower when you have a higher volumes because the plant runs 24 seven. So you're continuously converting the waste into energy products. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, uh, thank you everybody for participating. Since we are running out of time, uh, we will take the questions, uh, you know, we'll direct them to the uh, respective uh, speakers over mail. And we'll also share the contact. A lot of people have asked for contact details of the speakers, So we will share that along with the PPTs. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your inputs and, uh, you know, detailed analysis of the respective topics. I. Uh, now, uh, you know, Joydeep, uh, please, uh, you uh, wanted to make an announcement, which is very interesting towards the end of the webinar. So over to you, Joydeep. Thank you, Sapna. And thanks to all speakers. This was wonderful and gave us a, a story ideas, at least gave me story ideas that I didn't have before. And that's the important part of it. Okay, uh, now to all my colleagues, if you are looking for story grants to chase these story ideas, please go and apply. I've just shared in the chat box the call for applications. So please go ahead and apply. And I think today we have got a lot of story ideas in areas that we do not often cover as part of RE. And I mean, new te technologies, for us at least it's new, pyrolysis. Uh, is a story idea I got. The major uh, advances in storage in India is a story idea. And there, there are, uh, uh, round the clock, I think has got less, far less coverage than it deserves. Solar rooftop, what Sunil was talking about, uh, is something, I mean, we have all been doing stories where we keep criticizing discoms. And, but uh, I don't think we have actually looked at this angle as, as to DISCOM's role in discouraging solar rooftops. It's, it's really an interesting story idea. So go ahead, apply, and uh, keep them coming. Remember the deadline uh, to give, put in these applications. I'm going to make one last request to Rahul and then we shall wind up. Rahul, uh, Vinay and Charmin have already uh, agreed to share their PPTs. Is, is it okay that if you share your PPT with everyone? Yes, yes. I'll, uh, I'll share a copy with you. Uh, uh, sorry for uh, doing that. I was just making some changes earlier today. So I'll send it after the this immediately. To me. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very also. much. It was very interesting and very yes. nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jadeep. And I hope that we'll have many more column inches coming out uh, speaking about the energy transition narrative. And oh, the journalists are very interested. I know that. Journalists are interested. Yeah. And we are looking for fresh story ideas. Hopefully, the, today has been very good for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Nice to meet you all. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank